Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about ordinary least squares. The prerequisites for this video are linear algebra and mean squared error estimation. The goal is to derive the ordinary least squares estimator, which is uh, a fundamental estimation technique in statistics and machine learning in two different ways. So let me remind you that we're interested in the regression problem where we want to estimate a response, a certain quantity of interest, which we call a response from some observed variables, which we know as features in machine learning or sometimes as covariates or independent variables in statistics. So uh, you should go and watch the, mean, the video on mean squared error estimation if you haven't, but let me give you a quick, uh, a quick recap. There we modeled the, um, the response as a random variable y, the features as a random vector x, and we derived the linear minimum MSC estimator, where basically we take a linear combination of the features x uh, with a constant vector, and we, de we derived that the best constant vector is given by the inverse of the covariance matrix of the features applied to the cross covariance between the features and the response. The issue with this result, of course, is that um, we need to compute this covariance and this cross covariance with, from actual data because um, random variables and random vectors are great for modeling. But at the end of the day, when we need to estimate actual uh, quantities, we, we have to do it from, from data. Okay, so here, um, these are our notation for the data that we have to, to make these estimates. We're going to have n examples, and each of the n examples is composed by an observation of the response, which we call y1, y2, etc., and p observations of p features, which are, um, uh, which are stored in a vector x1 for the first observation, x2 for the second observation, and so on. Um, using all of these features, we're going to define a feature matrix, x, where each of the columns has p entries, okay, which correspond to the p observations, uh, sorry, the p features correspond, uh, corresponding to each observation. So the first column is the p features in the first example, second column is the p features in the second example, and so on. Okay, so now we need to estimate these quantities that give us the best mean squared estimate. Of course, by the way, when we say that this is the best mean squared estimate, that would be true if we knew uh, the covariance matrix and the cross covariance matrix, but as we see now, they have to be estimated from data. Okay, so it's very important to realize that. And um, if they're not estimated uh, accurately, or if the model is actually not a good model in the sense that there's not a fixed distribution connecting the features and the response, then um, this might not be optimal. Okay, in any case, a reasonable way to proceed is to estimate the covariance matrix by just uh, computing the sample covariance matrix of the data, which looks like that and can be written in terms of the feature matrix like this, and uh, the sample cross-covariance matrix. Since you might not have uh, come across sample cross-covariance matrices, this is exactly the same as a covariance matrix, except that instead of having entries that are the sample covariance between the different entries of a vector, which is the case for the covariance matrix, when we have a cross-covariance, it's the sample covariance between uh, y, in this case, one of the variables, and the other one, okay? In this case, it's between y and the different entries of x, okay? So here, the first one gives you the sample covariance between the first feature and y. The second entry gives you the sample covariance between the second feature and y, and so on. And um, you can write this as x applied x uh, being the feature matrix applied to the vector of observations of the response to the response vector y and divided by n because we're doing this average. So now our best possible vector of coefficients according to this MSC theory, this mean squared error theory, is equal to 
when we plug this in, the inverse of xx transpose times xy. Okay, this is our um, a reasonable estimate for this vector of linear coefficients that allows you to do um, to to fit a linear model. Now, let's consider a deterministic viewpoint where we forget that we have all this MSE theory, like this um, minimum this is mean squared error theory. Uh, there's no modeling with random, uh, sorry, with uh, probabilistic assumptions. And what we just say is we say, okay, we want some kind of constant vector of coefficients such that when we take a linear combination of the observed features in our training set, we approximate the response in our training set. And a reasonable way to quantify this approximation is to just take the, diff the square difference. And we sum it over all our training set, and we just want to minimize that. So again, no probabilistic assumptions whatsoever. We're being very pragmatic here. We're saying we have a training set, we have a linear model, we just want to fit it as best as possible. Okay, so if we do that, we can write this uh, sum of um, squ squared residuals as just y minus the transpose of the feature matrix times the coefficients. And we expand it. When we expand it, we realize that we have a quadratic form which is um, as a function of beta, of course, because beta is what we, this constant uh, vector of coefficients is what we want to determine. So now, um, this we already proved in the, um, in the video on, on mean squared error estimation. So again, I, I encourage you to, to go back and take a look at it. Um, but basically we showed that if this matrix, so in a quadratic form that is of this form, B, beta, transpose a beta plus b transpose beta plus c if the matrix a was positive definite then we could find the minimum of this function by just setting the gradient to zero okay that's what we showed in that video so now we should ask ourselves if is if this uh, matrix xx transpose is positive definite and in fact, it is as long as x is full rank because we can write v transpose xx transpose v for any vector v as just the square del2 normals of xv. And if xv is not zero, then the, this um, square del2 norm is going to be positive. So this means that the matrix xx transpose is positive definite. Notice that here, this uh, matrix is essentially the sample covariance matrix. So we obtain a, a very similar um, uh, very well, we reach a similar conclusion that the one we, uh, we reached when we were looking at mean squared error estimation. There we said, okay, the covariance matrix is full rank, then it's positive definite, we have a single minimum. Here we're saying if the sample covariance matrix is, um, is positive definite, then we have a single minimum by setting the gradient to zero. Notice that the sample cover covariance matrix appears naturally from this cost function, even though um, we have made no probabilistic assumptions, okay? So it's a very natural object in itself once we are interested in L2 norm estimation, even without probabilistic assumptions. Okay, so if the covariance matrix is full rank, then uh, we can just set the, um, the gradient of the quadratic form, which is equal to this. You can check. Of course, the gradient with respect to beta, okay? The gradient here with respect to beta. You can check that it's equal to this. We set it to zero and we get that our vector of coefficients is exactly the same as the one that we have found through this other argument where we had taken the best MSC estimate and we had replaced the sample co the covariance by the sample covariance matrix and the cross covariance vector by the sample cross covariance vector. Okay, so we reach exactly the same conclusion. Now we're going to apply this technique, ordinary least squares to a data set of hourly temperatures measured at the other stations all over the US. The, whole, the goal here is to predict the temperature in Yosemite. I chose Yosemite basically because I used to live in California. Uh, so, you know, just because of that, no other reason. And uh, we are going to try to estimate the temperature in Yosemite using temperatures from 133 other stations. So we have these 133 uh, features. 
um, at that particular time. So maybe the logic here would be that if you're in a central station and you need to estimate, you need to know the temperature everywhere, but suddenly uh, you're not, you don't get a reading for the temperature in Yosemite because something has broken down, you can still use the temperature from all the other stations. Of course, probably you would want to use past temperatures in Yosemite and so on, but you know, just to simplify matters, here we're only going to try to estimate the temperature in Yosemite directly from the temperature at these other stations at that particular time. Okay. Um, our training set is, and test set is going to be data from 2015. We're going to take out a thousand uh, measurements out randomly to test. I'm also going to have an additional test set, which is measurements from 2016 to see if our linear model is still valid in this other year even though there could have been some shifts in, in climate or something, which could have made it, you know, which would made it, make it less precise. This is just to showcase that you often want to make sure that you have a held out data that is really, really held out. Okay, so these are the results here. I'm showing you what happens up here. If you just estimate the um, temperature in Yosemite using the station that seems to be closest to Yosemite in the training set, which is a pretty naive estimate. That naive estimate give you, gives you an error of about 5 degrees Celsius. Here, by the way, I should have said that this earlier. Here we have number of training data. So I'm fitting a model using different number of data from 2015 to see what happens to the error. So the training error is in purple, the test error is in red and the tester from 2016 is in green. And essentially what happens is that as we go to the right here with more and more data, we converge to an error that is approximately two and a half degrees, which is actually pretty good. And it's much better than if you just use a single station. So this shows that the linear model is actually doing something. Notice that we have something quite interesting going on around here where the test error essentially goes down and uh, the training error increases. We're going to explain this uh, in a lot of detail by analyzing some, um, some mathematical models um, in, in the next videos. Thank you very much for your attention. Today we have learned that the OLS estimator, the ordinary least squares estimator, can be derived either from the linear minimum MSE estimator if you want to make probabilistic assumptions or directly from the least squares cost function.